character is how you present yourself to the world, especially today when human contacts are so quick. Fashion is instant language. That's what the head designer of the Prada Design House said. Clothes really do communicate a lot about a person. I remember 10 years ago when uh, Shelly and I were coming here to interview for the pastoral position. And we, we always, you know, it matters what we wear, but that time, more than any other time, we really thought about it. And I knew that our church had, uh, uh, was used to seeing their pastor, their, especially their lead pastor, in a full suit and tie. On that day, we said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a bridge and also chart a new course. And it may not sound like a big deal to you, uh, but I wore a, just a, like a suit coat, no tie, and my shirt untucked. And I think that maybe at the time that was a little revolutionary. It's not anymore. Uh, but the, what, what, how you dress, what's on the outside, does really communicate a little bit about what's going on on the inside. So we're in this Sunday morning series called Epic Bible Stories and kind of focusing on Old Testament Bible stories this summer. And you're going to see in a few minutes how clothing relates to the story. It'll, it'll come up in a minute. So today I want to talk to you about, uh, with a message titled, If it was a snake, it would have bit you. <laughs> if it was a snake, it would have bit you. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 2. I know many of you have it, uh, your Bible on your phone or your tablet or whatever. That's cool. Grab it. Let's go. Genesis chapter 2 will be there in that, uh, that chapter and the following today. In Genesis chapter 2, you can see over and over and over again how much God cares about you how much he loves people. It, it, it really comes through in what he did. So uh, right off the bat, God formed people, and he formed that first man, Adam, Adam. He formed him out of the dirt of the ground, but he didn't just, just form him out of the dirt. He also breathed into him the spirit or breath of life. So God put his own spirit, his own breath of life into that first person. And God created a garden in Eden, which means a beautiful place, a delightful place, a pleasant place. And God, God filled this garden with beautiful trees loaded with all the most delicious fruits. And I can just see that Garden of Eden, trees loaded with red and gold rainier cherries from Yakima. <laughs> That is where the best ones are. And we have tried them from three different cities this summer. We know it's Yakima. And I, there were trees loaded with juicy Georgia peaches. Mm. There were other trees that had nice, crisp Wenatchee apples growing on them. I mean, it was a beautiful place. And God basically said that to the first man, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. 24-7, all the finest things that I have caused the earth to produce. It's yours, all of it, with one exception. And we're going to look at that exception in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 15 to 17. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat from every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Listen to what he said. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Very clear there. So God gave us a bounty. All these beautiful fruit trees and vegetables and just all these, these wonderful things to eat. God gave us a bounty and just gave it to the first man. Uh, to the first man. And he, he said, though, I've given you the bounty, but I'm also going to set a boundary. And so that's what God did. He set a boundary around that tree. So I'm going to skip down to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. The serpent, somebody say serpent. Serpent, serpent. that word means snake. The snake or the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And so I thought it might just sort of make it a little bit more clear to show you. So, Zach, could you help me out and uh, bring your little friend over to see me? And uh, that way the people online uh, can see him or her as well. Oh, spreading out a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. 
all right. Uh, so uh, this is a, an actual live snake. Well, why don't you just show all the kids that are gathered here and uh, stay, you know, stay socially distant, but show them, let them see the snake. All right, so the Bible says that the snake or the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day, and I'm assuming after studying the, the woman's vulnerabilities, the serpent asked the first woman, so the wife that God made for Adam, he asked her, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? So just to clarify, this is a real snake, uh, but Satan was using that snake as a tool. So, uh, so Satan was speaking through that snake. And verse 2, Of course we may eat, the fruit, eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the, tree, the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, now this is Eve saying this, God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Is that what God said? It's not. She added a little bit in there. She actually misquoted God. And she added words to what, she, what he said. God really said, if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. She said, if you, if you, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. There's a difference there, and it's, it's kind of an important one. She spoke as if God created this poisonous tree that if they touched it, immediately they would die. But that's not what God did. She was just a little teeny bit off. So the tempter picked up on this. Satan picked up on that, and he became a little bolder with her. Verse 4, You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So he basically said, you won't die, your eyes will be opened. You won't be punished, you'll be blessed if you eat the fruit. Satan is a snake. I've got a little present, and I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and bring that now uh, for all the, all the uh, little uh, toys for the kids. And it, it is some little snakes, some little toy snakes. And I debated about this. And here's, here's the spin I'm going to take. It's a snake to remind you, watch out for the devil. Because he's always trying to get you. And he's always trying to get you in between you and God. And we don't want that to happen. So kids, as you get these little toy snakes, remember to watch out for Satan's tricks. Fear comes from him. Condemnation comes from him. Separation between you and God comes from the enemy. And so these little snakes are going to just remind you about that. Watch out for Satan's tricks. So the bottom line of this message is this. If you could sum it up, it would be this. If you can recognize Satan tacti Satan's tactics, you can fight back. If you can recognize Satan's tactics, you can fight back. And that's a lesson we want to bring for them. Satan is real. And he is just as cunning and crafty today as he was back in the Garden of Eden. So I want to talk about three things that Satan still tries to do to us. Three tactics so you can be aware, so you can be watching out, and you can recognize it and fight back. So no, the first one is this. He tries to confuse us. He tries to confuse us. And we can see it in what he did with Eve right back there in the Garden of Eden. He said, did God really say... And then he misquoted God. Wow. If God was good and kind, it just doesn't seem like he would set a boundary like that. So Eve starts mulling this over and starts thinking, oh, huh, is, is that true? Surely this is some kind of mistake. <laughs> Today he says to us, maybe the Bible isn't really meant to be taken literally. It's more of an allegory, more of a suggestion, really. That's, that's him trying to confuse us. He, Satan's strategy is always to try to get us to doubt the trustworthiness of God's word. And if he can do that, man, he has, he has really gotten the upper hand. So I'm going to say to you, don't let Satan confuse you. Yeah. Dig into God's word for yourself. You've got to know what it says. 
and that comes by reading it, by pausing, by meditating on it, by, by bringing it into you regularly, every day, being, being in God's Word. Second thing that Satan tries to do, tries to caricature God. You know what a caricature is, right? You go to the fair or, or someplace on vacation, and there's art, an artist out there on the, you know, on the street fair or the farmer's market or whatever, and he draws a picture of you, or he or she draws a caricature of you. And in a caricature, a lot of times your body's little and your, big, your head's big and huge, and he will find one little seemingly insignificant part of your body, not my nose, <laughs> and he will exaggerate it and make it bigger than it, than it really is in, in real life. That's a caricature where you take one little kind of out of context thing and just, uh, just focus on that like that's the big thing. And Satan wants to caricature God. So God declared all those trees in the garden theirs for the taking. God in, in declared all those animals there to, uh, to be led and ruled over by Adam, Adam and Eve. God, God gave them this whole plush thing. God was like, yes, 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 yes. And God had one no, just one no. Just don't touch that tree. God is a God of yes with one little boundary. Satan said, God is a God of no. That's a caricature. That's focusing on the one little thing and ignoring all those blessings and just focusing just on the one boundary. And all those blessings, by the way, and that boundary were for our good. Even the boundary was for our good. And Satan focuses and says, oh, God is the God of no. Satan says things like, uh, what's the matter with looking at something just a little spicy? It's not really hurting anyone. But is that what God says? Satan might say, well, what does God care what you do with your money? Man, doesn't he want you just to enjoy life? Why does he want all your money? Don't believe Satan's caricature of God. Find the photograph, the image, that you can see little snapshots of God, of who he is in reality. And you can trust the true character of God. He never changes. He is consistent and loving and faithful and true. The third thing Satan tries to do, and we see it in this passage, Satan wants to beautify sin. He wants to make sin so attractive, so beautiful, that you can't resist. That's what he's trying to do. So Satan tried to convince Eve that sin would set her free and help her finally to realize her full potential. And today he whispers, go ahead and leave your spouse. You'll finally be free. Go ahead and vent your frustration. You'll feel much better. Just go pound some things. Just go yell a little. You'll feel so much better. Take another trip to the buffet. Buffet, buffet. <laughs> Flirt with that person that you know is trouble. Sin might seem beautiful, but its results are always ugly. Sin might seem beautiful, it might appear beautiful, but its results are always ugly. If you can recognize Satan's attacks and his tactics, you can fight back. Let's skip down to verse 6. We're in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. She could be just like God. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. Little, little uh, known fact there. So what is the husband doing while his wife's sitting there talking to the devil? I don't know. Like, there's, there's some things. There's some issues there. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. When God created those first people, didn't put clothes on them, just put them in a perfect climate, and there was nothing hidden. They were just open and out there for all to see. Uh, so they suddenly felt shame. They suddenly were, were realized they were naked. They felt ashamed about it, embarrassed about it. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So Satan had a little nugget of truth in there in his invitation because when they sinned, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened to guilt for the first time. 
Their eyes are open to shame for the first time. The eyes, their eyes are open to embarrassment for the first time. And they, they, they began to see each other uh, where they had viewed each other's bodies as beautiful and made by God. Now they suddenly felt shame and wanted to hide them. Yes, their eyes were open to all that. But Satan forgot to tell them that, that detail. Oh, and by the way, when they're opened, it's not going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be really bad. Down in verse 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And because they heard him, I, I just kind of wonder if it was Jesus uh, before Bethlehem uh, walking in, in the garden. And so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And realize God knew where they were. That's not what he's saying. He was not saying, what's your GPS coordinates? He's saying, man, where are you? Where are you at? What's going on? Verse 10, the man replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Adam and Eve were ashamed and embarrassed for each other to see their nakedness. So they sewed a type of belt, uh, the language implies, with some fig leaves, sort of like that. This is not actually a fig tree, but sort of like that. All right, so nice big old green leaves. And they, they sewed a little belt, uh, and uh, each one of them put one on to kind of cover their lower bodies. Fig leaves, I've learned, have a very rough underside, and they secrete a little sticky substance. Probably it's a self-defense mechanism for the plant. So to wear these fig leaves would have been very uncomfortable and sticky. It would have been very unpleasant for them. And I think back to what Prada said. Fashion is instant language. And what this couple was wearing said so much about what was going on in their hearts and in their lives at this time. The first clothing communicated uh, so much that when God, uh, when God called Adam, where are you? Adam blurts out, in essence, I was afraid to come before you because I was naked. But Adam wasn't naked. So the fear was not that God would see him naked. He had clothes on, remember? He made, he made clothes. He wasn't naked anymore. Adam thought that the fig leaves were enough to cover his nakedness that uh, his wife would see, but apparently he thought that was not enough to cover his nakedness before God. The, the fear that Adam felt was more about knowing that he had disobeyed than knowing that he was naked. Verse 11, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Remember, they've gone, you know, however long, never, never knowing or realizing that there was anything wrong with how they were. God said, who told you? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. We, for a long time, we always thought he was blaming the woman. He's really blaming God. It was a woman, you, you gave me, I, it's, not, it's not my deal, you gave her to me. She gave me the fruit, I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. And so, mankind fell because it couldn't resist a small temptation to try some fruit even though it had a bazillion other fruit trees to eat from. Do you ever try to put a spin on your behavior or to justify your motives before God? So many times we say, I know I lose my temper sometimes, but this is how God made me, how God made me. Wow. Well, so-and-so hurt me first, so I'm justified in hurting them. They started it. Well, if my boss paid me better, I wouldn't have to just pad my hours on my timesheet. It's my boss's fault that I cheated. 
Adam and Eve's sin was not just eating a bite of fruit. They dishonored God, who had so lovingly provided for all their needs. So God let them experience the consequences of their actions. And God pronounced that women would suffer pain in childbirth and struggle with submission to their husband going forward. He declared that men would have to struggle against the ground that was now cursed in order to produce food to eat. It used to just be easy. Just had to pick it and prune it. And now it was a struggle. I love how author Kurt Strassner picturesquely summarized the, the punishment, the consequences that came, and these are, are, are found in the next few verses in chapter 3. Whether they wanted to admit their sin or not, Adam and Eve's rebellion came with great consequences. Perfection was replaced with pain. A joyful marriage became an unequal partnership. Happy gardening became sweaty toil. The beautiful garden became a briar patch. Once imperishable bodies began slowly to decay and die, and they were thrust out of their garden home forever. Wow. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, this is what it says. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, and so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So all of us, every person on the earth who has ever lived has inherited this sin sickness, this sin condition from Adam and Eve. So what have, we been, what have we been talking about today? God creates bounty for our enjoyment. God sets boundaries for our good. Satan tempts us to sin and dishonor God. Sin separates us from God. God's punishment for sin is death. But the good news is that God paid the penalty for our sins. And we see a little foreshadowing of it right all the way back there in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. This is what it says, And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Now, it, it appears that God created Adam and Eve to be vegetarian. So the first animal that was killed by God was to provide a covering for Adam and Eve. Can you imagine how much, that, how much that must have hurt God's heart to kill that animal, to make leather clothes for Adam and Eve? Jesus came and he allowed himself to be stripped naked, beaten, and hung on a cross so that we could be clothed in righteousness. Righteousness is right standing with God, a right relationship with God by the amazing grace of God and by the shed blood of Jesus. God sacrificed his one and only son, Jesus, so that our sin can be forgiven and our shame can be covered. And so many times I've said this, but now you have the biblical context. All of us, you and I, were born sinners. All of us. We are all born into sin. You might think, well, I haven't done anything that bad. That's not the point. We're, we're all born into that condition. We're all born into sin. Because when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. That is our condition. But Jesus came... And he took the punishment. God's punishment for sin is death. And Jesus died. He laid down his life. He took that punishment. He paid our penalty for our sins. So today, I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus, in the work that he did for us, in the fact that he paid the penalty for our sins. He was the sacrifice for us. How do you do that? How do you put your faith in Jesus? How do you appropriate that forgiveness and that sacrifice for yourself? Well, turn from your sin. Turn from all those things that you do and say and think that harm yourself or others. All those things that separate us from God. Turn away from that. Do a 180 and turn your life over to God and let him lead. That, that is the start of, of becoming a Christian, of, of, of putting your faith in Jesus. 
Would everyone that's here in the room please stand right where you are? And if you're watching online, would you just pause for a moment and just make this, uh, make this a time of prayer? Uh, prayer is talking to God and listening to God. So w- would you all, would you bow your heads uh, for prayer if you're in the room? Would you bow your heads? And I, I would love to just invite you to become an apprentice of Jesus like I was just describing. Put your faith in him, begin to learn from him, follow him, uh, live and act and be like him, following him, our perfect example. I want to invite you to do that. So I'm going to just pray a prayer, just one line at a time. I'll pray a a, a phrase or a few words. You just repeat after me, all right? And uh, if today you would like to put your faith in Jesus, maybe for the first time or you're coming back to him, would you just raise your hand if you're in the room so I can see you and know specifically who I'm praying for? Uh, That that you're saying, yes, that you're saying, I I want to put my faith in Jesus. Uh, That's awesome, and I appreciate that. That's good. Let's pray. All right, so I'm going to pray a line. You pray after me, but don't say it to me. Say it to Jesus. Okay, let's do it. Jesus, you say Jesus. And let me hear you in the room too. Encourage those that are, that are online. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer today online, uh, watching, or here in the room, we believe that the answer is always yes. When you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, the answer is yes. That is God's heart. He's waiting to do that. He wants to do that. You are forgiven. And I I would love to just help you with some next steps. So if you prayed that prayer today, whether you're here or watching online, would you go to the website and click on the connect card? And at the bottom of the connect card, there's a little box to check that says, I prayed that prayer. I made the decision today to follow Jesus. And that will will be enough of a prompt for me to just send you an encouraging email, all right? So do that. But I'd like to pray for everybody watching and everyone in the room. One more thing. Could you bow your heads one more time? And we've been talking today about the enemy's schemes. Satan is real. He wants to confuse you. He wants to distort God's uh, image in your mind. And he wants to beautify sin. And he's after you. He's after me. He would love it to just divide you and me from God. We're not going to let him. And I'd love to pray for you this morning. Uh, If you would say, uh, uh, Pastor, would you pray for me? I I want to recognize, I want to be better at recognizing Satan's schemes, and I want to fight back in spiritual ways. If that's you, would you raise your hand? My hand's up, because that's me. I I want to be better at recognizing the Satan's schemes, and I want to fight back more consistently, all right? So many, many hands up around there. I just want to pray for you, and I'm assuming your hand is up watching at home also. Lord, I thank you so much for your word because you've given us all that we need uh, to know how to fight. You've shown us, you've revealed the enemy's tactics. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom, the sensitivity to, to, to recognize it when the enemy comes against us. When, when we start to think bad things towards you, God, or we start to think, well, you're not very loving or something like that, would you help us to recognize that that's the enemy's work? When sin starts looking more and more attractive and it's just a little increments at a time, we begin to just embrace that idea just a little at a time. Would you stop us short? Would you speak to us? Would you, would you help us to realize that we're on a slippery slope and help us to get off that slope. And Lord God, help us to be in your word, dig into your word and and just bury it deep inside of our hearts that our reactions and our responses and even our, our choices would reflect you, who you are. Lord, I thank you for your help. You have not left us alone. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that you put inside us so that we could be sensitive to what's going on in the spiritual realm. Lord, we praise you. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for participating today. What a great word. Thank you for preparing us well. Uh, Right now, if uh, you are joining us for the first time, whether that is online or um, here in our service, um, we would like you to let us know by filling out our Connect card. You can do that through the app or through the website. Um, And the reason we ask for that is that is our way to be able to reach out to you and connect you to our community um, and help you get involved here at NFC. We would love that. And if you have kids, we also have a YouTube um, video for them. So right on the YouTube page, you'll see that there. You can play that for them uh, right after this service ends. And happy July 5th. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.